we are going to jump into the first set of exercises of this day. And uh, this is going to be a session which seeks to address the questions and requests put forward yesterday um, on uh, with respect to GIS, geographic information systems. Maybe I'm, I will begin this session rather than jumping into the model. I think I will begin it first with some discussion of the the sort of considerations for GIS, and and we're then going to weave in GIS to a model, and in fact, the very model that we built together yesterday. But first, I want to situate it within the broader context of dynamic modeling, okay? So, uh, geographic information system, uh, geographic information systems have led to a revolution in geomatics and understanding of phenomena over geographical space. Um, over the past several decades, uh, whether it's in areas such as policing or epidemiology, real estate, countless commercial applications beyond that, urban planning, et cetera. Um, it's no exaggeration to say that, that uh, the geographic perspective as enabled by geographic information systems has uh, been a a really prominent shaper of understanding, of, of particularly fine and grained understanding of phenomena and patterns in the world. And often these patterns are dynamic patterns. We see changes in health burden of COVID in different neighborhoods um, or changes in the vaccination status of those, those neighborhoods. We see evolving real estate prices, or we see evolving uh, crime. If anyone could make note of the blanks again. Yeah, I'm on. Thanks a ton. Um, we see those evolving over time. And it's only natural as such that we seek to weave together geographic information, fine-grained inf uh, information with modeling. But agent-based modeling in particular by virtue of its ability to depict a fine-grained environment for agents, to situate diverse agents in an environment, and to watch their evolution, to have them be affected by that environment, affect that environment, um, reflects a, a particularly natural marriage of geographic information systems and dynamic modeling. Now, uh, I would love to show an example. Um, uh, this one here, if anyone's interested in opening it, you can find it in the uh, example models. Um, and if time allows later in the day, I may seek to explore it. Um, it's one involving uh, supermarkets and food deserts. Um, within the context of uh, uh, of Melbourne, Australia, um, but more more deeply, it's about um, the integration of GIS data into agent behavior more generally. Um, if if you want to find this, if anyone's interested in opening it and playing around with it, uh, if you go to example models and you go to hybrid models. Um, there's a GIS uh, food and PA environment um, uh, with scatter plots V7 there that uh, you could go download and open it up and run it. And uh, you'll find that it depicts a geographic situation where, where supermarkets can be added by, by double clicking on the map and 
individuals move around and exhibit um, changes in their health status, and particularly their obesity, in a way that reflects the, the built environment, the presence of parks, for example, as well as the availability of different types of food from convenience stores, less healthy fare, and from grocery stores for, for healthier fare. And geographic aware models um, of this sort um, are, are growing increasingly well supported by software, although there's still quite some, some needs uh, unexpressed. And uh, this content uh, often not only speaks to answering questions and, and addressing the problems posed to us as modelers by those needing insights uh, or needing to make decisions. Uh, the very use of this sort of modeling speaks to stakeholder understanding and appreciation of modeling. There's something about geographic context and environments and information being captured in a model of a familiar environment that um, that uh, is gripping and communicates what modeling does to stakeholders. That's not a small matter. It's, it's a curious psychological phenomenon that I leave to later generations of um, uh, human computer interacting interaction experts to address. But there's something about incorporating GIS information into models that can really help people understand what how models function. And geographic data stored in GIS databases and available via GIS servers online is uh, one of the most common sources of, of big data to be used in ABMs. While we build ABMs with data from smartphones or data from social media patterns or online search volumes or what have you, um, it's GIS data where perhaps it's most uh, uh, the most consistently powerful within our models. And uh, geographic information can let us link model information to other sources of data. Um, could uh, uh, could some one of the TAs uh, go get a tech staff member? I think it's trying to explain like again. Uh, yeah, like again, just saying. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so if you want to link to regional case and testing data or, or you have data on neighborhood vaccination status or or um, or income by neighborhood, by cross-linking with geographic information in the model, maybe it's pollutant levels, you can often um, inform the model with extra information for the agent circulating in it. And you know, there's a huge set of expertise with respect to uh, to geomatics. So, what are some ways that our models use geographical information? Um, well, uh, one way is um, yeah, Rob. It seems to be blinking about once every five minutes, something yeah. like that. So, I think they're open. So I see. I see. Yeah, if you could let them know, it's still a major problem. Fred was asking. Thanks. So what are some major ways that they do interface? Well, one is agents determine the distance of certain resources from them. How far are is a supermarket from them? Or how far is a clinic from them? Or how far is a health service? How far is it to where vaccines are delivered or testing site for COVID-19, right? Um, and they make their decisions based on that how far it is. Maybe they elect whether to go or not based on that distance. Or maybe in other cases, you see, well, in other cases, we use the geographic information to determine agent exposure to adverse retail and promotion efforts. So in the States, this meant be tobacco billboards and outlets. Um, uh, it might be you know, advertising for fast food or what have you. Um, yeah. In other cases, um, you're 
trying to inform an understanding of healthy behaviors involving, you know, walking, biking, uh, taking the bus, uh, you know, driving, and uh, you can recognize distances and the nature of the environment, say it's walkability, um, or the ability to access a bridge over a river, or what have you, uh, as it might affect the agent's choices for, for how to engage in different modes of travel, which might in turn affect their physical activity levels, et cetera. Um, if you're interested in getting understanding exposure to pollutants, things like PPM 2.5, um, you might be interested in the paths that agents take. Do, are they taking a path that exposes them to more pollutants or exposes them to certain other types of hazards, maybe to crime? Um, in other cases, agents are associated explicitly with resources, maybe they're community organizations or clinics, et cetera. And uh, those agents are situated and interact with clients because of proximity. Um, I'd mentioned creating information on background risk in different areas and accumulating exposures. We saw a little bit of that yesterday, although it wasn't fine grained in terms of where um, you know the uh, the pollutant levels at at uh, certain points outside, but it was at certain locations inside. And capturing features and limitations of movement. So if you're simulating the spread of of uh, chronic wasting disease among mule deer, it matters that they might not be able to cross a swiftly flowing river or something like that, and, and that might prevent the infection, or maybe it's rabies, prevent it from making its way over to the opposite bank. Um, there are times where we actually drive agents by the mobility patterns observed in the world or some abstraction by that. And we use that to kind of um, uh, to, to subject them to certain um, exposures along the way. And we simulate the long-term health evolution. Or we have, may have characteristics of these agents that are calibrated to such patterns. Um, so they might be patterns from smartphone-based data or from um, vendors that use data collected from phones commercially to, to track population movements, such as was um, increasingly used during the pandemic. Um, uh, there are times where the simulation augments the GIS data, um, and we, we use it to sort of try to understand how much pathogen we might expect spread in different areas of, or pollutants, or we produce data in the model, we compare it to or calibrate it to what's observed in the world. Um, so what are some common sort of tasks in agent-based models informed by GIS? Well, accessing GIS information via databases, loading of GIS shape files, something that is you know, I would say only supported in its more basic form, um, uh, not with any bells and whistles and any logic and with um, some extra work being required as I understand it for different layers. Um, you commonly have a continuous space without, um, um, without any sort of exclusionary features like you might have in other forms of environment like that shelling segregation model that we saw, only one person could be in a square at a time. Here, it's continuous space and typically agents can pass each other without, without issues. Uh, if that's not the case, you can use like the traffic library in any logic or some other form that captures exclusionary components. Um, we have information on the latitude and longitude, the heading, the, the direction, an agent is going and their and, and their location any one time in lat latitude and longitude. And we query GIS data for particular information. So a few pragmatics before we get into exploring this example by building it up and as time allows um, some of these other examples. Uh, GIS 
in integration with models does not come for free. It it offers some, it confers some significant benefits, but it 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 also has costs associated with it. Um, the benefits are broad. I had noted them earlier, and they do include stakeholder clarity and excitement and, and buy-in to a model, which is incredibly important, as well as sort of scientific or, or, or substantive um, uh, findings uh, impact on the model. But GIS features have significant impact on model computation time, how long it takes to run the model, um, the memory used by that model, and the amount of network demand ceteris paribus for that for that model. I say ceteris paribus because as as the, the lecture yesterday from Eric and from Mike uh, conferred, particularly Eric's comments, it is possible to take a model's communication over the network and instead get a lot of the information it would need to normally gather over the network and put it onto your local computer, which is means it won't need to go over the network for it. For, for privacy reasons, security reasons, prevent eavesdropping on on queries across the network that may be valuable, uh, may be essential if you're using, say, police data. Um, and there's a phenomenon of what Eric called caching, and that's a computer science term, but it's ubiquitous computer science. But basically, it means um, being intelligent about, about reusing information you've already retrieved once and about having it in a very accessible and a very fast way so you can reuse it very quickly. It's one of these tricks we use in computer science to speed things up. If you've used it once before, have it handy um, so that you can quickly use it again. Um, okay, um, so uh, I give you those choices yesterday. So that was a bit about sort of situating why we use GIS. How do we use GIS? What are common needs in GIS? What are common tasks? Uh, what are some trade-offs? Um, I'm going to be walking you through some exploration, some building of GIS components. But first, I want to answer any questions from people uh, on this topic, which I'm really covering in more detail by request. So are there any questions here on just what I've talked about now before we dive into a hands-on example, which will illustrate many of these principles? Are there any questions? Questions from online? Questions in the room? Nothing? Okay. Right. Well, I'm not complaining because we're going to need every minute of this morning's time to address the agenda. Okay. Uh, so we're going to be needing to cover a couple of things this morning, and this is just the first of them. So um, with those comments, I'm going to stop this recording.